LA's homeless problem is not a mystery to anyone. It's a growing, blatantly obvious, unavoidable fact of Los Angeles life at this point. The homeless issue has led to calls for the recall of Mayor Eric Garcetti, and just recently may have motivated the departure of the head of LA Homeless Services, an organization tasked with addressing the crisis. It's a pervasive and expanding problem that seems to get worse despite all the efforts to combat it. Estimates of those without shelter range from 50 to 60,000 every night, almost all of those living on the streets. Statistics say that about a quarter of them suffer from mental illness and about 15 percent have substance abuse issues. Hello, everyone. I'm Hal Eisner. While many politicians have addressed the issue of homelessness and many have proposed solutions or pressed for change, there aren't a lot who have managed to share a personal emotional connection to those who live on the L.A. streets, except the man who is the outgoing L.A. City Council president, Herb Wesson. Wesson has made his own personal connection to the homeless issue part of his campaign for L.A. County supervisor. He put out campaign ads narrated by his wife that put a different kind of spin on the situation. This is my husband, Herb Wesson. We married when my son Doug was young. But today, Doug is often homeless and addicted to crack cocaine. And he's gone missing again. Herb's been Speaker of the Assembly and City Council President, but he's always been there to search for Doug and coax him into rehab. As County Supervisor, Herb won't give up on anyone, like a dad who loves his son. Joining us now, Herb Wesson. Those are powerful, those are poignant images, and uh, tell me about this search for your son. Well, This has been a situation in my family for almost two decades. Uh, I kind of get to know where he hangs out. He had been doing so well, and then all of a sudden had a relapse, and I I was able to eventually find him, but it takes a little work, and the people on the street kind of get to know you, and they helped a great deal. They have been phenomenal, but it's something that we as a family had to learn to deal with and it's something that at this point in time we just felt it was appropriate to share he's 50 yes 50 years old and can we talk about the mental health issues at play here well i don't think at this point we want to keep anything from anybody the most important thing is to let people know that this can this can happen to the former speaker of the assembly or the president of the los angeles city council it can happen to any of us and our hope is that this will definitely help move this conversation forward on how we deal with folks on the street that have addiction issues or mental health issues or in doug's case both issues both issues you know you were followed around by cameras so you know it may have been a little i don't know how awkward that was going down skid row in different places with cameras challenging i'm sure it was challenging but but there's another ad and this is the one where you actually find doug right yes you find Doug. doug let's take a look at that no one expects their child to end up here this is my husband herb wesson and he's searching for our son doug again Chronic drug addiction and mental illness can lead to homelessness. It's why Herb expanded supportive services as city council president. And he can do more about all of this as county supervisor. You pray for a happy ending. Maybe this time. And that's Doug right next to you, isn't it? Yes, it is. That's Doug. Tall Los fella. Angeles homeless, what is it? I said he's a tall fella. He is a tall fella. The Los Angeles Homeless Services Authority in 2019 said there was something like 50 to 60,000 homeless people on any given night. About 44,000 of those people on the streets. Almost 9,000 of those people, somewhere under the age of 24, some of them actually minors. It's extraordinary. And, you know, I was in Hollywood the other day. I'm going down Vine Street. I've never seen the median strip filled with tents before. It's become so pervasive and yet we've had all these efforts to try to battle this problem and 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 it seems like it just keeps getting worse well sometimes it's darkest before the dawn and the one thing that keeps giving me hope is that every day more people seem to recognize that this is the number one issue in this region you see governments genuinely trying to work together for the first time and i believe if we keep at this we keep our head down we tie 
lighten up, not lighten up, we, we somehow will find the light at the end of the tunnel. What do you tell those who might be detractors who say, well, you know, using your son for political gain? Well, for me, it's, this is so much bigger than the campaign. This was something that we as a family had a conversation about. Just about every member of my family does something public service related. Just about everyone. Doug wanted to do his part. So our initial thought was that it would be he and I walking the streets of Skid Row having conversations. And then he had a relapse and disappeared for about six weeks. And that's when I was determined. So you're not saying anything wrong with this as far as those detractors who might say you're using your own family story for personal gain. You know, I think that this is one of those unique opportunities where I can take advantage of having the resources to tell this story so that individuals sitting at home can say, I have a brother or my aunt Mabel's son, or I can relate to that. I've been going out to the community and people are talking about, I was a victim of domestic violence and I never shared that with anybody. So I think whenever there's a conversation going on, the possibility for solutions exist. And I hope that this is what uh, happens with this. And I really don't care uh, if there are a small percentage of people that might think there's selfish reasons behind it. I this. wanna put up a picture here of, of the family Yes. Well, Doug is. It's when we first really kind of hooked up. That's my the three my son, Herbie, Patrick, and Doug. Okay. And uh, just tell me, and we're going to wrap up this segment, just tell me, how's Doug doing? Believe it or not, we reconnected last Tuesday. He stayed with me through the entire holiday. And yesterday, we were able to get him into another rehab facility. So like my wife says, maybe this time will be the charm, but we won't give up on it. Good luck. Thank you. Happy Thank holidays. you for having us. It's the holiday shopping season. How to avoid counterfeit gifts and holiday scams. L.A. City Attorney joins us on the other side of the break. Last week, the holiday shopping season kicked off in a big way with Black Friday. But the festivities came with a warning. The city attorney telling shoppers to beware of counterfeit and recalled products. Do you think about counterfeit products? Yeah, I, mean, I actually like to buy stuff that, I don't like to buy the cheap stuff because you get what you pay for. What you pay for may be cheap, but according to city attorney Mike Fuhr, it could also be dangerous. Take for example, he says, these fake phone chargers. 400 of them they tested, 99% didn't work. But worse than that, those counterfeit items pose a threat of electrocution or other serious injury to somebody. Fior and District Attorney Jackie Lacey called a news conference to talk about their concerns when it comes to counterfeit gifts. And the residents of LA County look to us in law enforcement to protect them. It's not surprising that a lot of shoppers don't think about being ripped off when in the holiday spirit. I actually don't because I believe the store. I have two kids, we have a big family, so I'm usually looking for the cheapest prices. But you might be getting something that's fake. Oh yeah, that's true. But it's not just about buying cheap. We are very concerned that people's hard-earned money doesn't get squandered on a good that doesn't work the way it was supposed to. But so many times, that good could pose a threat. Phone chargers, jewelry, makeup, batteries, smartphones. They look like the real thing, but the two top attorneys say, buyer beware. And it's not just fake goods, it's also recalled ones. So this is an example of what might look to you to be an item that you might purchase for your child because we purchased it from walmart.com. The city attorney says it was recalled because this strap didn't always work. The city attorney's office sent the cease and desist letter to Walmart asking them to stop selling the product and to refund people who had previously bought it. 
We asked Walmart for a response. They told us, quote, an item identified in City Attorney Fuhr's letter was not sold by Walmart.com, but by a third-party marketplace seller. It is against our public-facing prohibited items policy for a seller to offer any recalled products on our platform, and the item has been removed and the seller has been notified. Moving on, there are people who are cautious like Tammy Hosner. Ever worry that if the price is too cheap, it's one of those too good to be true things? Super, I believe that. <laughs> Super, she believes that. Well, joining us right now, Michael Fior, the city attorney of the city of Los Angeles. And uh, have you had many responses since that news conference you had telling people to be careful? We haven't had a lot of responses from consumers, Hal, but we are in the process of looking into other significant retailers, especially with regard to the sale of recalled items that may implicate the safety of them and their families. Now, you're expanding this effort? Absolutely. You know, in our office, we could be focused on a range of consumer protection issues, from the Wells Fargo case we did to these kinds of cases. I'm focused on the intersection between consumer issues and public health. You know, in that bullseye comes, for example, goods that might not be safe for your infant child. We want to be sure we're out there protecting people. And so, so you know, we saw all these people Black Friday out there shopping in the malls, right. and and you saw them too. Yeah. Do, do you think that there are going to end up being some people that are going to be like? There unhappy? are people. There are people who are going to be ripped off. And there are people who might be purchasing a good that might not be safe for them and their families. And one reason it's so important to be doing shows like this is to raise the consciousness of members of the public to the importance of not being ripped off by a, cons a counterfeit good or a recalled good. And there are steps people can take to avoid being scammed. And those pictures we're looking at right now, yeah. these are some of the items that concern you? These kinds of items concern me tremendously, again, as a, for, as a parent of kids who are now grown up, but we purchased items like these for our kids. And some uh, of these things have been recalled. They've been at stores that uh, are well-known stores, but yeah. the U.S. Product Safety Commission has been looking at some of these things. Well, and, and here's the thing. The Consumer Product Safety Commission has a website at cpsc.gov. A consumer can go on that website to see what items have been recalled and be sure they're not purchased something that has been. I want to make a little turn here and talk about sure. holiday scams. Yeah. You, you've got a lot on that. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, the thing about scams is this. There are people who are well-meaning who could be victimized precisely because they have big hearts. For example, there are fake charities that will call and try to solicit you to give money to them. There are folks who call, there's a famous grandparent scam. Hello, Grandma, is that you? Silence, because the caller is waiting for Grandma to say the name of Hi, the kid. Hi, Johnny. Is that you, Johnny? Right. Yes, it's me, Johnny. And with that information, you know, I'm lost or I'm, I need $500, please send it to me. We're trying to prevent people from falling for scams like those. But it's not just that. It's uh, scam credit cards. Right. It's gift cards. It's, it's counterfeit money. You know, when a consumer goes online and the seller is demanding payment by gift card, that's a, a good reason to stop right there. If you get a phone call soliciting that, stop right there because that gift card is like money. If you don't get what you're paying for, you're never get your money back. So, so this gift card is really sometimes the biggest signal. Buy a gift card for your teenage kid, that's one thing. Having a seller demand a gift card in payment for something you're seeking, that's something else, and you should reject that out of hand. You know, you've had news conferences, I think, almost every holiday season right. that you've been in office, uh, and I think I've covered most of them, but, but I gotta tell you, does it have an impact? Well, you know what? Sometimes we hear back, thank you very much for alerting us to this. Sometimes we're never gonna hear from the consumer who in her busy life is just trying to make ends meet, but has been following these tips. But I have to say, the scammers know that a parent in a two-working parent household where they have kids, they're exhausted, they're trying to save money, they know that that person could easily be a victim. So we have to be even more vigilant and more assertive about communicating to the public how they can protect themselves. 20 seconds. Yeah. If it's too good to be true? It probably is. Mike and by, Fior. by the way, low prices could be a sign that this is something that you ought not be buying. Really discounted prices on items that are sold for much more elsewhere could easily be counterfeit. Uh, good advice right there. Thanks for joining us. Always great. Good to Al, see thank you again. Thanks so much. Happy holidays. You, to you too. Thursday was International Volunteer Day, honoring those of you who volunteer for organizations. When we come back, we'll meet volunteers from the Red Cross that help during emergencies fires, and even the Rose Parade. See you on the other side of the break.
They dish out food at mission dinners. They hold the hand of seniors facing hospitalization. They feed and comfort shelter pets and offer care and comfort to those dealing with disasters. If there is a need, they fill it without complaint and without pay. They're the nation's volunteers, and there are a lot of people who wouldn't make it without them. Just recently, Red Cross volunteers were honored for their contributions on the one year anniversary of the Woolsey Fire. I was there. If you were a volunteer, raise your hand so that others can see you and so that we can say thank you. You're looking at a small fraction of the hundreds of Red Cross volunteers who rolled up their sleeves and helped those in need of help during the massive Woolsey fire. A blaze that destroyed about 100,000 acres, killed three people, and caused for almost 300,000 residents to have to flee their homes. You've been a volunteer for 10 years. Yes. Mimi Reichenbach was one of the 700 volunteers and 500 others, like Renato Lira, who just showed up to help when they saw the smoke. When we saw the smoke coming in, we went, you know, to start helping out the community. We on don't your own, on, on your own. own. You know, we don't, you know, we don't wait for it and no one phone call or nothing. In her 10 years of volunteering, Mimi says Woolsey was the worst fire she ever saw. Yes. Why? Um, the magnitude, the amount of people that were affected, um, the fierceness and veracity of it. November 8th, 2018 is going to remain in my mind for as long as I live. When Nancy Hall and Jim Topping got the word about the fire, they were celebrating their 30th anniversary last year. So now it's a year later. This is your anniversary. Yes. You've been married 31 years today. And to Nancy, having to ask people if they lost their homes as they checked into her shelter was the hardest thing she's ever had to do. Emotionally, how, how challenging was that for you? <sighs> Very, but you really can't. You have to hold it back. In the way home on the, in the car, we would always tell each other the stories from the day. But during the day, the people that you're, you're meeting with are so damaged and in shock. And that's understandable. The terror of seeing oncoming flames that may have destroyed your home and everything in it, except what precious few things you could save. Even some Red Cross volunteers had to flee their homes. Um, I was at the command post the first night, and I had to leave to come home to evacuate. So that was a little tough. I would imagine that's a lot tough. Joining us now, Los Angeles Red Cross CEO Jared Barrios and two of the organization's volunteers, Randy Furman and Roseanne Sorbach. And first, Jared, uh, is it fair to say that the volunteers are sort of the, the heartbeat of your organization, the Red Cross? It's more than fair to say that. Uh, we actually track every hour from our volunteers. We do about 95 percent of our work from the labor of volunteers. you have a sense of how many volunteers you have? We have about 8,000 here in LA. Nationally, the American Red Cross has, uh, gosh, about 350,000. And I'm gonna get to your volunteers in a minute, but I wanna ask you first, what does it take to be a volunteer? There may be people out there right now who are, are thinking, well, gee, I ought to do something like that. It, it takes the will to volunteer, something most of us have, and uh, the ability to get online and go to redcross.org slash volunteer. And, and all the sort of information on what you need to qualify is all listed Absolutely. there? Absolutely. You sign up. A lot of the courses to get trained are online, so you can just do it from your home. Uh, and then you just start volunteering. And I think you immediately begin to sense how transformative it is. You know, we help people, but we are helped in helping people. And that's the beauty of volunteerism. So one of those helpers is Randy Furman. And Randy, why did you get involved in volunteerism? Well, I kept up my certifications. I was already volunteering for the Boy Scouts, and I needed to have some advanced uh, medical certifications for rock climbing. And uh, as I got more and more into the Rose Parade, uh, the first aid and everything, uh, I found that it was also an outdoor adventure, and it was fun, and I, and I just kept doing it. Roseanne, what about you? Well, years ago I had a business and uh, it kept me very busy, but I used Red Cross as a diversion. Uh, it, it gave me a way to, to get out and see the reality of the and world. That can be a pretty rough diversion, though. I mean, you've got some of these fires and some of those things where you have to help people who are evacuating their homes. Exactly. That's not a, a, an easy diversion. It, it's not, but what, what really enticed me was the people that you meet, the volunteers and all of their different backgrounds, whether it was education or work or life experience, all the different backgrounds that come together to help people. How many years have you been doing this? 35. 
volunteering for 35 years? Yes. I thought you were like 34. Almost. Almost, okay. <laughs> but, but 35 years you've been volunteering. What, what motivated you to start volunteering? In the very beginning, um, well, to step back just a little bit, my, uh, my grandparents were both uh, volunteers for Red Cross. Boy. My mother and her sister were nurses for Red Cross. My husband and I work Red Cross, and even my son works. Uh, helps with Rose Parade when he comes down from school. But um, I, I enjoy it because it's giving back to the community. Now you've mentioned Rose Parade a couple of times and, and both of you will be at the Rose Parade. What do you do there, Randy? Well, I organize 200 some odd people uh, for that event. Uh, we, we run uh, 13 uh, first aid stations and there's all of the activities of organizing the, the radios, the logistics, and uh, just a getting, lot of people out there. I mean, you know, it, it's often probable that you'll end up with medical situations in a parade like Over that, right? Over 60, 70, 80 every year that you'll have medical situations where people have to get hospitalized. And the volunteers are the one leading, leading the show. Every one of them is a volunteer. I just have to ask you, people give money to the Red Cross all the time. And then sometimes they say, well, does the money really go to where it's supposed to go? So I would be remiss if I didn't ask you to answer that question. Absolutely. Well, this is, this is the beauty of giving to the Red Cross and organizations like the Red Cross that use volunteers. Think how far your dollar stretches if 95% of your work is done by volunteers. But the money goes to where people Absolutely. think it's going to go. Absolutely. Not just so, administrators. So if you were to write a check for the Woolsey Fire, for example, right. we can only spend it on, on the, the Woolsey, Woolsey Fire. Fire, either our expenses or to support, make financial assistance to victims. Absolutely. That's the law, and we respect that at the Red Cross. All right. Well, Jared, thanks for being here. I really appreciate it. You know I talked before. And, and to you two, uh, thanks for your service. Thank you. You've been doing a lot of volunteer work well, over these years, welcome. and it's very much appreciated by the community. And thanks to all of you, all of you who spend time volunteering. We'll be right back. We're going to continue our conversation on holiday scams and dangerous gifts with city attorney Mike Fuhr on my podcast, What the Hell. It's available wherever you get podcasts, it's your Spotify, iTunes, but also at whatthehowpodcast.com. And to our guests from the Red Cross, what's the final thought you might have for everybody out there this holiday season? This holiday season, one, uh, those trees get really dry. They're very flammable. Keep uh, flammable things away from those trees so you don't get burned out of your house and um, be good to yourself. Teach yourself CPR this year. Randy? Think positive thoughts uh, and have a good time with your family. Enjoy the people that you know and are with. Roseanne? I would say to consider going to the Rose Parade this year. Stay hydrated, dress in layers, and for the new year, consider joining the Red Cross. And for me? everything they said. That's it. See you next week. Thanks for joining us for Fox 11 News In Depth. Bye-bye, everybody.